Any any questions about essay writing? We talked a little bit about it last time, but maybe just ask you now whether you have any any further questions or worries. Of course, get in touch with me if you are stuck with your research. And let me see if I can give you feedback. At the beginning of such a large research project, it should feel a little bit amorphous. I mean, actually part of what you're trying to do when you have to discover your own research topic, to find your own research topic, is learning how to deal with being in a situation where it's not fixed, you know, and, and uh, the boundaries are not clear. But hey, life is like that, you know, that's the situation you'll be in a lot of times. Uh, so it's pushing everything back onto you to find out what is of interest to you uh, and what will be your approach to things. So you have to be the active agent in the situation, not choosing uh, an essay from a list of t topics or something like that. Life isn't like that, you know, there isn't a list of topics that you have to pursue in life. Or if someone tries to tell you there is, you should be a bit wary of it. Um, so it's all part of the process that at the beginning things will feel a bit kind of out of control and not sure. Uh, but you, you're learning about whatever you're working on. You're learning about yourself and your own attitudes, your own preferences about art, your own intellectual attitudes. This is why it's all such a valuable valuable thing and in, in, in a little way you're also getting on the thread of your own creativity you know you, we, we're, we're studying artists who led immensely creative lives but creativity is important for all of us we all should have creativity in our lives and since uh, I don't know what other things you may be doing but I know that you are doing writing and writing can be one tool for creativity it's obviously one thing that you're thinking about over your years as a student, how to hone your skills in writing, thinking through writing. Often it's important in um, working on your essay topic to, to forget about that essay, think about it as a research task. The writing task comes later, don't think I've got to write an essay, what shall I write about? Think. I, I'm going to find something that interests me and investigate that. I'm, I'm not looking for a research topic, a research question. Then when you found what you found, then you can decide, well, what would be the best way to present this? How shall I structure this, this, uh, this topic? So the writing phase comes separate, and that has its own challenges and interests as well. So to some extent, you'll separate the two things out. Although. A lot of people do find that it's useful to do a bit of writing early on so that when you do come to do your main essay writing you've got bits and pieces of writing that you can already add in. Say you do, well I'll do an analysis maybe of this one painting uh, and, and, and try to, to, to think about it, try to write about it because doing so might help me to clarify my thinking, you thinking through writing. Uh, you might think you understand what your position is about a particular painting, what your interpretation is, but until you put it down into words, you, you may you may not find you might find ah, it's when I'm writing, I discover I'm saying something different from what I thought I believed. I've discovered I'm believing something a little bit different, or I'm discovering that the logic of my argument or the evidence is not really there for what I thought was going to be my position. So I need to think again or. I need to find some more evidence if I'm going to try and argue this. Ideas without evidence to back them up are just assertions, you know. Just because you read something in a book doesn't make it true, you know. I mean, that's, there are all sorts of stuff written in books, um, written on websites especially. <laughs> and it's important, that what we're learning is how to critically evaluate the different opinions that are given to us. So. Uh, we need to, you know, if you're impressed by someone's argument, yeah, you better show the evidence that they gave that impressed you when you present it in your own, uh, your, your own essay. You don't just say, oh, so-and-so says this. Yeah, okay, a lot of people say a lot of things. It doesn't matter. But why is that to, to be believed or to be given credence? So any, any worries, any thoughts about essay writing? 
some of you are still to give your presentations, but that's beginning to come to an end now, that phase, you know, except for the Wednesday group, because there's another public holiday this week. So uh, the Wednesday group won't finish, hopefully will finish next week, Wednesday groups. Um, but for the most part, the focus should be moving towards your essay. Okay, good. So we made a very brief start last time looking at, uh, thanks, if you put it there, uh, looking at the work of Surah. We looked at some of his early work, and this is the first work we just started looking at the Bainyad, or the bathers at Asnier, seen on the river Seine just outside of. Paris itself, or well, nowadays it would be part of the city itself. The city has grown to overtake these semi-autonomous uh, suburbs. I pointed out last time when we just started looking at it at, it at the very end that it was quite a large painting, about the size that you're seeing it projected on the screen. and. Um, Consequently, partly just simply as a result of size, but also the fact that it's a multi-figured painting. No clear-cut narrative, but there's a lot going on. S rather static figures, not a great deal of action, but nevertheless there's, there's a lot going on. Um, as a result of that, there needs to be quite a lot of preparatory work. You can't just suddenly start painting, uh, a painting like this, you know, you've got to plan it the same way you'll have to plan out your essays or go through different drafts with your essays. You need a kind of road map before you start writing, otherwise you could easily leave, end up with a very muddy kind of awkward structure to your essay. Same with a, a painting of this kind. Impressionist paintings are often much more informal, smaller affairs done directly in front of nature, or at least started in front of nature, maybe finished off in the studio, but much more directly responsive to a particular motif, a particular place. Well, Surah was engaging with a very particular place that's mentioned in the title, Asnier. It's not a made up location, it's a real location that many of the many or most of the viewers would already be familiar with when they first saw this painting in Paris. Um, but nevertheless, the, the, the image as a whole is constructed in the studio. So I want to look a little bit at the kind of process he went through to produce a painting. So an, a painting like this would require preliminary paintings and preliminary drawings to work out the composition and so forth. Um, uh, unlike the method of working of an uh, impressionist artist like Monet, we don't really have many preparatory drawings that have survived for Monet paintings. You just work directly in paint. Um, we don't have studies of details of the paintings. But with Surah, we do. So let's have a look at that. Well, first of all, detail. He made many of these very finished drawings. Now, a lot of artists' drawings in preparation for paintings uh, would be quite unfinished because they they would not be intended for a public. They're not intended for to be displayed. Uh, nowadays, everything from the hand of a great artist is valuable and will, will enter a museum. Or, you know, will have a high monetary value. Uh, but I don't think that would be how most artists would have think about their preparatory drawings. They think of it as a private notation. It's like a, a sort of diary note or um, you know, something intended that you, you make that's intended for yourself, a way of thinking. But nevertheless, for Surah, his drawings ha are quite finished in the sense of uh, a lot of detail. He studies the individual, the figures individually. Now, with with impressionist paintings, you they very much tend to think of the figures in relationship to the environment, trying to look at how the light falls on everything, integrate the figures with the environment, create a sense of oneness. 
Um, but for Surah, that doesn't seem suitable. He wants to emphasize a bit more the human content. So maybe his distinctive stylistic innovations are partly to do with that, introducing a kind of clarity that enables a human focus, or if you want to put it another way, a social focus in his paintings. It isn't just about light. There is a strong sense of light and atmosphere in the painting, but unlike a, a Monet or Monet painting, it isn't just about about that. So you can see this in the the working process, looking at the figures individually, then adding them together in a painting. There is a slightly more additive feel to the final work, uh, betraying the process by which it was constructed. Whatever method you choose will end up influencing your final result. You know what? Um, that's not just for painting; it's for all kinds of activities. So, yeah, the task of making the painting is very much about how I'm going to organize these different figures together into an overall composition. So you see how he, you know, the figures are semi-clothed anyway because they are um, bathers, you know, and it's a sort of a naturalistic reason why they wouldn't have much clothes on. So it becomes close to... The, you know, the, the, the traditional classical notion of the nude and the investigation of the human figure. Uh, and so when he's looking at individual figures, you get that sense. Figures in isolation, because that's, um, it's easier. I mean, he would have been posing a figure in his studio, uh, clothed or unclothed, and he's got to study the anatomy, he's got to study the light and shade, you know, uh, drawing is, uh, in a monochrome medium, that's very good because you're getting rid of color so you can concentrate on issues of light and shade, clarify them in advance of beginning your, your painting. Maybe he would try the model in different positions till he finds one that is, is most suitable. Static posed figures as they are in the final work you know then they become very static in the final work his drawings just immediately look very distinctive the style of them is so distinctive and that goes down as much to anything uh, uh, to the technique that he's using with the materials he's using both the, he's using Conte crayon particular kind of crane it looks like a almost like a pastel smaller maybe uh, but less chalky it has a, a, a I think usually a wax or something like that to hold bind the pigment together it's a graphite pigment um, I think it was invented in France at a time when other artist materials were not available due to the British blockade, naval blockade during the Napoleonic War. Anyway, it was uh, a technique that he probably uses to greater effect than any other artist. And he's using it um, on a particular kind of paper called Angra paper. It's, uh, the name is just the name, same as the name of the painter, I-N-G-R-E-S. And it's a very ribbed surface to this paper. You can still buy it today as an artist's material. Um, it's quite suitable if you're using Conte crayon. In fact, it, Conte crayon works well on a, a rough surface. It could work quite nicely with, uh, with, with uh, pastel as well, I think. So it has a kind of ribbed surface to it. You can see that coming through that produces this kind of dotted effect in a way. The, 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 the ridges of the paper pick up the pigment and then the, the, the lower valleys of the, the surface don't, uh, so that you have this lovely kind of mixing of, of light and dark. Of course, if you really want to have a, a, a greater sense of dark, you can, you just have to push down, you crush the ridges down. It's only paper after all, so you can defeat it if you want to by break, you know, breaking down the fibers. So you have the possibility of darker darks if you want to, but also these lovely middle tones.
So it's drawing, but drawing, I mean, the, the one thing you normally see in drawing, you, you're not seeing here, and that is uh, line. You know, there, there isn't really, there are boundaries, but not, there aren't outlines. You can sort of see how he maybe had to make up the marks through, uh, through linear, you know, uh, linear traces, but then the fi in the final work, you those are covered up. I imagine, you know, with a with a Conte crayon like a pastel, you could use the edge of, end of it, or you could use the side of it. So you could create areas, or you could create linear marks. You have that freedom that you don't have with a with a pencil. So you can study micro details of the and painting in advance, you know, you could spend a lot of time just thinking about the ear of one figure within a painting if you wanted to. So very lovely studies of just details. So it requires you to have thought out in advance exactly what you're going to put into the final painting. Thank you. Of course, there are many aspects of the painting that you're not considering when you're making drawings like this. You, you've eliminated color from the question, so you, you don't think about color. But remember, Surah had a training in the Academy of Fine Arts, the School of Fine Arts. Um, and so really what he's doing, he's going back to that academic training. Although he's, he's an avant-garde artist right at the cutting edge of what's happening in Paris at that time. but he's making use of methods that were learnt in the academy. This is a typical way of working to produce a large multi-figured painting in the academy that you, you do drawn, drawn studies. Even in your whole approach to the to study, you know, you start off with drawing and then you move on to, to do painted sketches and then you finally produce uh, larger paintings. So it almost replicates the, proce the, the process of academic study. So on the one hand, he's using the drawings to study anatomy and posture, poses of individual figures and the tonality of the painting. Then he's also making painted studies to do something a little bit different, to think about the composition or even what the choice of motif might be. So whereas those drawings one would imagine are posed in the artist's studio under artificial light. These small oil sketches, they're, they're about this size, very small, uh, would have presumably have been made out in the landscape itself in front of the, the scene. You know, they're small enough to easily be carried with you. You could carry more than one with you to, 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 to work with on the river bank itself. And they're very unfinished in, in feel, uh, very spontaneous, but um, you know, because they're not, like I say, they're not meant to be seen by anyone. They're, they're part of the artist's private thinking process, so he doesn't have to please anyone. He's not trying to produce a finished work that you could, be, you could enjoy. Um, you see the brushwork, crisscross brushwork, which we saw in others of the early works that uh, I showed you last time. Well, just trying to get a sense of the overall composition of the scene. Well, he's got the viewpoint, the sort of diagonal view at the river bank. He's even found a particular point on the river bank where there's a little kind of cut into the, the bank. He seems to want to include that. And He's got the idea of including this factory that's in the background. There's some clothes, so there's a, some trace of human presence, but um, no actual human figures. It's almost like an empty stage set. Seems to be using these drawings. I'm imagining that he's observing things that were actually there, you know, almost like a sort of snapshot for photographer. Um, observing oh scenes of people bathing there and deciding whether uh, this would be suitable for the painting. 
he doesn't he doesn't have to make up his mind straight away I mean that's often a good way of working same thing with your essay you can try out different things see what works figures on the bank figures in in the river he doesn't have to think about the anatomy of the figures that's all done in a very perfunctory kind of way he's not worried about that here because he's going to think about that in the drawings. He's given plenty of attention to that in the drawings, so this is not the time for thinking about that. Uh, it doesn't even tell you the facial features of the, the figures. That can all be sorted out later. When, if he likes this composition, the figure in that pose, he can then pose someone in his studio and draw them very carefully. He doesn't have to think about the tonal arrangement of the painting. That's all something for the drawings. This is one that comes a little bit closer to the, the final work. I'm not saying that they're all just snapshots of reality, things that, that he ever sat down on the bank and saw something exactly like that, this. This is a bit more like a, a compositional study where he's putting together different motifs. And here we see it coming to look a little bit like the final composition. So some may be more studio productions but some of them do f have the feel of being observed from nature. Oh, maybe one day there were some horses there, oh, a white horse. Okay, so we'll consider. Maybe we'll have uh, a horse in the painting. Maybe we'll have uh, sailing boats in the, in the painting. Or oh, a black horse instead of a white horse. Or Maybe black and white, you know, he's thinking, you know, well, that's nice to have uh, tonal accents, black and white accents. And in the sailing boat, there's black and white. Okay, so he's thinking about tonality a little bit here. But it's more at the level of jotting down our ideas than organizing uh, a, an idea that's already been settled. In the final painting we come rather closer than we do in many of these studies. It's a more distant uh, view of everything. Eventually the idea of the horses, well it's a nice theme but in the end he decides to abandon it. It doesn't get into, it doesn't make the final cut to, you know, to use a metaphor for filmmaking. You know, filmmakers will shot, shoot loads of footage when they're making a film but maybe a lot of it is not going to be used. Even whole, sometimes there's whole actors, their whole performance doesn't make it to the final film and things like that. Oil paint allows you a lot of reworking. You know, you can scrape out oil paint and rework, unlike, say, the Chinese uh, ink on absorbent surface. You've got a, one chance to, to do that. Um, so, thinking about the working process, thinking about sources, Piero della Francesca, one of the great artists of the Italian Renaissance, now very famous, but perhaps not quite so famous in that time. Um, one could say that maybe Surai is one of the people who've um, made him famous, you know, by, by, by rediscovering him. I just choose one work uh, at example. We do know that he copied some frescoes of Piero della Francesca when he was a student. So there is documentation that he was uh, interested in uh, Piero's work. There's often a sort of stillness about Piero's work, a sort of monumentality, frontal views and profile views, very organized structure. And all of those things can be found in Seurat's work, especially this Beignard. So an artist who looks back to art history, again, that's his academic training coming in. If you look at the work of Monet, you can hardly see any uh, traces of the, of the history of art, any kind of quotations from earlier artists' work. It's almost as if the history of art didn't exist when you're looking at a Monet painting, except maybe for a few Japanese prints or something like that. 
That's the only trace that you can find of the parts. But for an artist of a, just a slightly younger generation, Surat, then the past starts to become available as a resource, and even the rather academic training becomes a resource for creating an avant-garde art. There's a kind of paradox in that. Just to give you a comparison of a riverbank scene by an impressionist artist, this is a chosen at random, a, an example of a Renoir painting, uh, and just give you a very clear contrast between the, the spontaneity, the informality of Renoir's scene compared to, to the, the, the Surau work, the Benyard. One more work we could think of in relation to it <coughs> would be a Poussin painting, the finding of Moses or a biblical story, but set on a riverbank scene. Well, again, we have a sort of diagonal feeling of the riverbank, even some of the figures a little bit similar. There's a boat as there is in the Surah painting. That history painting. It has something of the feel of being a history painting w w without actually telling, illustrating an, a narrative. It's this, the subject matter is like a, an impressionist painting, scenes of modern life, urban, ex urban life, but uh, treated almost in the manner of a, of a history painting. Cézanne once said, oh, I'd like to redo Poussin again from nature. I'd like to put together the, the world of the old masters and the world of the impressionists. And in a way, this is also what Surah has, has done. So something very considered. I mentioned last time how in this work you get different kinds of brushwork. I just mentioned it again. You know, there's a sort of crisscross brushwork for the grass, parallel brush strokes for the water surface, slightly different from, from the sky, and also for the, the flesh, much more smooth together quality. Um, and then he came back and reworked it a little bit later with this dot-like technique. You can just see a little bit of it around the hat and on the hat. Uh, his later pointerless technique. So it's slightly hybrid, but it, he hasn't yet come to the style which he's uh, becoming famous for later. Most of the Impressionist painting is painting of middle-class life. Uh, but what we seem to be seeing here is more working class life. There's this question then of how much Surar is interested in a, a social dimension in his subject matter. Again, the, the informality of, uh, of Impressionist style, it's like the world of leisure of, of um, the whole approach to painting almost seems to mirror, as the great art historian Mayor Shapiro said, it seems to sort of mirror the informality of the bourgeois vision, the bourgeois world of leisure. Um, but there's Seurat sort of cutting, cutting that. He's bringing class distinction into the, the field of uh, modern life as a, as a subject to be addressed. On the boat, there's a top-hatted bourgeois gentleman, uh, very different from this, sort of these figures here. Maybe these are working people who, on their day off, you know, from work in the factory. Work, it's leisure, but work is not too far away. You know, the, in, in, in the most impressionist painting, leisure is an autonomous world. It's uninterrupted by, uh, by, by work. Almost like an 18th century aristocratic world of pleasure in a painting by Votto or Fragonard, you know. We don't know that much about Seurat's political beliefs. He a, was a very much a sort of private person. We didn't know much about his private life either. Um, but he seems to be in the circle of socialism, particularly anarchists. Anarchism was quite strong at that point in time. Anti uh, the authority of the state. So there's reason to believe that he was, and many artists, since anarchism emphasizes individual freedom, that 
naturally makes it very appealing to artists who, who like that sort of thing. So um, there's reason to believe he may be sympathetic to anarchist thought. Anarchist thought was very widespread in the late 19th century, early 20th century, early 20th century China, for instance, quite a lot of anarchists around. That all disappears later on. So juxtaposing classes or you know, sp a spatial topography of, of class, you know, because the middle class people are going over to the other bank. You know. they're spatially, their leisure may be somewhere else. They're not going to be here. You have a sense of light and atmosphere, but it, to me it, it feels slightly... Um, oppressive it's not you know they're at leisure but it's not that leisurely somehow there's a, there's this sort of stiffness about everything poses it seems so a little bit awkward in the hot sun some people are unclothed other people are very clothed um, it al almost feels like a very humid scene humid day Slightly oppressive, not purely wonderful, delightful, fresh day or something where you can just enjoy your le leisure. Nevertheless, there is a sort of stillness in there. The fact that this boy is cupping his hands to his mouth to make some sound, calling to someone hidden outside the edge of the painting, uh, that that reference to sound kind of underlines the, the quietness of the painting as a whole. The stillness and even stiffness of some of the poses. Everyone's looking in this, this direction. People are moving in that direction, mostly. He's calling in that direction. He, he acts as a sort of bracket closing off the composition here, but also links it beyond the edge of the painting. Cutting this figure of the, or the canoeist also helps to indicate space outside. Our eyes want to, to look over here, but we, d we don't have the same desire in this side of the painting. Even the dog is looking that, that way. So I think I mentioned last week about how all the reds and browns sort of tie together in the color scheme of the painting. hair color or color of the dog it's all chosen and lots of blacks and whites he didn't have the black and white horses in the end but anyway he had the black and white he had other wa other ways of composing with plenty of black and white and strong horizontals and verticals of the man-made structures of the factory behind this the pollution belching out, spoiling the, the, the scene of leisure, the complexities of modern life acknowledged. You know, in late, later life, Monet moved downstream away from the complexities of the modern city. Instead of painting in Argenteuil, where he had lived in the 1870s, he moves down to Giverny, painting his own garden hidden away from uh, the de being despoiled by the modern world but Sura wants to stay with the city wants to, to, to keep telling us about it so here is the Sunday afternoon on the island of the Grand Chat, which is the the second of his major uh, paintings probably his most famous one in the Art Institute in Chicago In some ways, because it's also a river scene of leisure, uh, one can't help but think of it as a sort of pair, in some sense, with the Baneyard. It's not a pair in the literal sense. They were never hung together. Um, I'm not even aware they ever have in their whole lives hung together. Maybe they have, but um, in some sense that, that, that you know because they're both riverbanks but they're opposing riverbanks they seem to, to go together 
in the last painting, all the gazes were from left uh, to right. Here, the dominant gazes are from right to left. It's almost like a mirror reversal. We're al almost we're on the other bank of the river that we saw those middle class figures going over to the the bank that is sort of you know there's something over here but we, we we don't quite know what it is but then in this painting maybe this as if it, this were that certainly it seems a world more predominated by the middle class this is you know this is the, then again a sort of social topography of leisure um, apparently it was different social classes would come to this island in it's not actually not the bank of the river it's an island in the middle of the river uh, but different social classes would come on different days so that's why the title is important the Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grande Jacques that's when the middle classes would come there but on a Monday the, you'd, you'd find workmen there at leisure People, there is different social classes here, I think. You, know, you can imagine maybe uh, um, some kind of uh, s social mixing, but the main um, dominant feeling is of uh, bourgeoisie, the middle classes. The style has changed already. You're much more aware of this pointillist style. Is that even this work is not a pure example of Seurat's mature style. He painted it first in um, an earlier manner, then went over it with this dotted style. Didn't work it that way right from the beginning. Certainly, again, a strong sense of, of, of light and atmosphere. One of the justifications of that s style is that it enables you to represent light in a more luminous way uh, than if you mix the colors on your palette first. The idea is to put pure dots of color side by side, which will then will mix in the eye, and that will produce a greater sense of light. You know, paint can never quite capture light you know you, there's never going to be a painting you have to put sunglasses on to to look at pigments don't emit uh, photons in that sense they just reflect So you're always looking for ways to increase greater sense of light or, or luminosity in your painting. Well, there's that pointillist technique has come in. That's one difference. But I think generally the way in which the figures are treated, there's a greater stylization to, to them all. much more emphasis on the profile view, profile views of so many figures or frontal views, back views. Sora had been given by Gauguin a Turkish painter's manual. Uh, you know, it's again a contact with another cultural tradition. He copied bits out of that. And apparently that emphasized making silhouettes of figures and so forth. So there's possibility of some influence there coming uh, in that way. Quite s stiff horizontals and verticals and you know the diagonal of the river bank again. Quite structured composition. This time there are so many figures that it would have you know required thinking out in, 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 in greater detail even than the Bainyard. Um, th I should talk a little bit about some of the scientific sources that he drew upon. You know, color during the 19th century starts to finally become more theorized. It was the one area of, of 
of art that wasn't really theorized that much before and therefore was you know was was given less priority in academic training but finally in the 19th century scientists start to think about color more and produce um, color theory that artists become interested in one of the the first was Charles Blanc, B-L-A-N-C. He wrote a book in 1860 called The Grammar of the Arts of Drawing. He is actually examining the practice of the great romantic painter Delacroix, um, seeing how he uses complementary colors together and Blanc advised mixing pure tones on the surface of the painting, which he sees Delacroix is doing. So this is a, a book a number of artists are aware of. Van Gogh, for instance, was, was perfectly aware of Blanc's ideas. And that perhaps is the basis of Seurat's pointillism, a sort of semi-scientific technique, rules of colour application. Seurat himself says, the purity of the spectrum is the keystone of technique. Since I first held the brush, I'd been looking with this basis in mind for a formula of optical painting. But, you know, it's not just scenes of bright sun, sunlight that he applies the technique to, he applies it to, to all kinds of subjects. So I think the technique is not just reducible to the desire to represent bright sunlight and so forth. He, I mean, Surah actually sort of says that. He says, I could just as well have painted a battle between the Horati and the Curati in a different harmony, picking to choosing a sort of classical Roman um, theme. Uh, there were a few other famous scientists thinking about color that would have influenced Seurat. Another uh, important name is Chevreul, C-H-E-V-R-E-U-L, Eugene, Eugene Chevreul. He wrote um, Actually, some of his ideas were already included in Blanc's writing, but uh, Chevreau wrote uh, about uh, his, his most important thing. is called On the Law of the Simultaneous Contrasts of Colour. Uh, his, his greatest sort of discovery or theory is that colours seem more intense when they're put next to the, their contrasting colours. So they're complementary colours. So red looks more red next to green than it does next to orange. And one can demonstrate that, that, that those kind of effects um, do work. The colour is alive, it changes depending on what its neighbours happen to be. That we appreciate colours um, relativistically in that way. So those are the, probably the most important think, uh, thinkers about color. There's also uh, an American physicist called Rood, R-O-O-D. There was a French translation published of his work, um, and Seurat would have no known that. So there are, there are, there are others, but uh, those are the main ones. Um, so he's applying, you know, scientific ideas to, to how he organizes his brushwork. Again, we can see this long process of preparation for this work too, another large multi-figure painting, so um, many drawings and again individual figures. So it's, there's a slightly additive working process, that's one way of working. You know. studies for the monkey. And then, as well as the drawings, the oil studies of the, the setting, the overall composition. This one is just like a sort of stage set without anyone yet appearing on it. Actually, someone did turn this painting into uh, a theatre piece. Um, Simon Son Sonderberg wrote, wrote a, 
a musical called Sunday in the Park with George and he introduces one by one the different characters who are going to be there uh, in, the, in the painting making up a kind of story about them and they sing songs and whatever and by the end of the, of the musical they're all on stage at the same time looking like the painting. So sort of thinking through the colour balances again, you know, no one's ever meant to look at a painting like this, except the artist himself. One thing you, you notice that's different here with the Sunday afternoon on the island of the Grand Chat is a painted frame or border, perhaps one should call it, within the work itself. There still is an actual physical wooden frame, but within it, on the actual canvas itself, he's created a sort of framing uh, border with colours that contrast. So, you know, next to the green of the tree, he picks up a lot of the red which is the complementary of green, so then hopefully can enhance the sense of the greenness of the green. The border shifts at different points, if different colours predominate more, um, depending on what he wants, depending on what colour is next to it in the painting. It's something he does in other works as well. Uh, and borders become, or oh, frame, sorry, frames become important for modern artists. A lot of modern artists start to be conscious of the frame. Where does the painting end and the, the environment begin? Frames are funny things because they're, they're both part of the painting and not the painting at the same time. The same thing, similar thing happens with sculpture uh, concerning the base. Uh, for example, the great sculptor Brancusi makes quite elaborate bases which are part of the formal dimension of the sculpture itself. They're, at the same time, they are a base, you know, or some artists will want to get rid of a base altogether, like a, a Giacometti sculpture might lie directly on the ground without having a base. Certainly modern artists are aware very much of how the environment and the, the artwork relate to each other. Once you get to the second half of the 20th century with minimalist artists and so forth, you start to get uh, artworks which really are about activating the whole space in which the work is in, 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 exhibited. Uh, the whole space becomes the artwork in some sense. Carl Andre will talk about his sculptures as cuts into the space of the uh, in which they're displayed. You know, they are just part of the the, the, the whole thing. Okay, let, let, let's leave it there. Let's have our break there.